Hello. Uh, hello and welcome everybody to my session at the Global Leisure Bootcamp today. I'm one of the first sessions, so uh, also he hello and welcome on the Global Leisure Bootcamp in general. Um, my session is about automated machine learning and as a data scientist, I uh, always take a very close look on all developments uh, in the in the data science and automate uh, and, and machine learning uh, science, and uh, so I really um, try to focus on on things that make life easier for us data scientists, but also on things that are thanks on things that are um, uh, you know there that. Uh, uh, let let the people do this uh, kind of uh, citizen data science and automated machine learning is uh, growing in, uh, in 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 this field and it's getting more and more important because tools like power bi and also the sap tools and all other uh, all other tools uh, as well as the azure machine learning workspace all of those tools are uh, generating interfaces to do these automated machine learning. But uh, first, uh, let's get into it. Uh, who am I? I'm uh, Mario Schnalzenberger. I'm a computer scientist, uh, statistician, and economist. Not uh, in 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 this order. So uh, sometimes I'm more into the statistician and also into the economist thing. But um, in general, I work with. Um, the company that you see here from uh, Cupido with uh, since 2014 on data in general. So this uh, is on data warehousing and predictive. And you can follow me on Twitter via this Twitter handle. So I'm, I'm tweeting about all kinds of things like economics, uh, statistics, and also on uh, data science. Um, yeah, you can see uh, that uh, uh, the Global Leisure Bootcamp, uh, at least in Austria, the Austrian version, is using uh, the Discord uh, app to communicate. So if you have questions even after this session, you can go there and ask us as a presenter uh, on details about everything uh, that's uh, coming up your mind. So you can go there and uh, post your questions like uh, any other chat and uh, we will take a look at this. So you, you, you have the chance with any other presenter as well. So I uh, recommend going there if you have questions that take a bit longer to answer or if you want to look what other questions were and uh, what the answers were. Anyhow, you have the Q&A um, uh, on, 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 the, on the Teams uh, uh, session that you are now viewing. The Q&A is uh, more or less uh, on, on, on the side. I can take uh, the questions, but uh, it takes some time. So you're always uh, like 30 seconds behind me. And this is very important. So your questions are not in time arriving at my side. So I try to answer the, the easy ones, but uh, the, the, the harder ones I will go for uh, on, on the end of the presentation. So please be kind and uh, uh, take take your time. You can answer questions, um, and uh, I, I will try to answer them. So where to start with? So automated machine learning is there for a while, but to know what's automated machine learning is, it is very important for you to understand what what is machine learning and how is machine learning operated. I tr I try to tell you something about model ops. Model ops is uh, a word that comes from from the DevOps side, and uh, um, uh, you will hear about DevOps in in some other sessions, also uh, on on the Global Azure Bootcamp. So it's it's very important on on the software side to have some uh, uh, development operations. So to know how to get your things, your your uh, your code in production. And it's the same with models. So when you are developing models, the models are not, you know, there's one model and that solves everything for the whole future. There is, you know, there is a development. You, you're generating new features. You're generating other features. The reality changes, you know, things change like the consumers change, like Corona happens and then there is no, uh, uh, no consumption on, 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 on the, uh, on the real side, but only on the virtual side. So 
there there are things happening that you have to change your models, and so you need some some kind of model ops. And model ops means there is a process of data science happening. Uh, the first thing is you always collect your data. You collect your data and you prepare the data, and uh, that that. That, that's a very important process. It seems on this picture that this is like 25%, but in reality, this is like 70 to 90% of your work. The next thing is you, you're doing your analysis. This analysis is always these, these, these kind of fancy things that are funny for me as a data scientist, but these fancy things are only like 5% of work, even, even less, maybe. Then you, you get some results out of that. There it's some kind of uh, cognitive work to develop uh, measurements, to develop results out of that, to develop uh, measures about, uh, uh, about what, what you want to do with this. Sometimes it means you want to go and take your models into production and you want to do some predictive analytics. But on the other hand, you might want to just change the process that you, th you, you do the things you do, um, like not producing in, in, in the night because in the night there is too, 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 too less uh, light on, on, on the workspace or on the shop floor. So you make so many errors that it's not worth it to start the production in the night, whatever. So this is not a, a, a kind of uh, taking models into production, but taking insights into production. And the next thing is after this, you improve, you, 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 you changed your work. So you have to start over again because you have to recollect data and start over again analyzing, did this change really change the thing or is it just, you know, just a, a, a bad insight? So this is the way you do things, but this is not new. It's, it's, it's the same process. This CRISP DM means uh, the cross industry standard uh, for data mining. This is here since the 90s. So this, this is really, it's all the same. It's no new invention. You have to understand the business. You have to understand your data. You have to prepare the data. You have to model. You have to evaluate. You have to develop. This is the same. But as you see, this is a circle. This is always happening more and more and more. And so you have to think about like software development. Software development is also a circle. Like, like this agile software development, you have to have a plan. Well, you know what? What the plan is, the plan is this one, but the reality is always this one. So you, you, you also with data, you, you, you think about, uh, you know, everything straight. I, I know how to get the data. I know how to get this and that. I know how to get the measurement, like getting temperature uh, as a measurement. And then, you know, the reality is sometimes your measurement sensor, your temperature sensor fails, and then you have like a missing data. And it's exactly the same time that you have an error on, on the other side. But that doesn't mean every time the temperature sensor fails, you will have an error. That would be the prediction. So you see, there is really a, a, a whole bunch of things that you have to keep in mind. And this, this is just a list of things that happened to me. Um, so there's this uh, very fancy term, GIGO, which means garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, that's true for data. There's no one size fits it all answer for anything. Uh, the data preparation is the most time consuming job ever. Uh, you have to check your sources. Uh, there, 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 there's accuracy in, 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 in the timing of, of your data. So if you want to make predictions, you have to have the data in time to make the prediction in time because otherwise you can't do it. You have format, you have data types. You, you have to have the data understanding. You have to know what the data is really standing for and so on and so on. So there are so many things. And I want to focus also on outliers. I, I, I like this outliers there. Uh, so is an outlier really an outlier? Do you want to delete outliers, for instance? Because sometimes outliers are also a measurement. So you know that there is something wrong with the data. Maybe there's something wrong with the process that's generating the outlier. So you don't want to delete the outlier in your data because the outlier itself is information. But yeah, whatever. So this is, this is one very important step in the process and also one very important you know, drawback in, in how you do things. And the process of machine learning, I, I, I tried to do some, uh, put some pictures up there that, that show how uh, that, uh, 
AutoML frameworks see the process because there are many different frameworks. I will present uh, many of them. Like uh, I think I prepared three of them for you. So um, uh, the the point is that there are so many things to do, and that they, they really reformulate things. But in in general, there is this: you have to get the data, you have to generate your features. I don't like this feature engineering because in statistics we don't have features, we have variables, but yeah, anyhow, this is naming. Uh, then you, you, you split up your data into a training set and a validation set. You do your machine learning. Uh, after your machine learning, you do the testing on a test set. So you have these triple splits. Many, many uh, bad data scientists forget about the test set. So they have this overfitting problem. You know, we will, I will mention that later on. Um, and then you get a model. This model is, yeah, you just have one step. So this is the first model. You don't know exactly if it's good or bad, but you can try to predict things. So this is the first step where you, you can do a prediction and you can do, go online for a prediction. But the reality is somewhat like this. The reality is you want to do like three or four different methods with random forest, with SVM, with deep, uh, deep learning and, and whatsoever. And you want to do these things with uh, many different uh, uh, sets of uh, parameters. So you want to do the parameter tuning as well. And then again, you get very nice models out of that. Um, in the cases where uh, where I present you the, um, the, 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 the demos is like, I, I've got one uh, auto ML that generates 35 models. So you want to compare those models. You have to have the test set as, uh, as set aside to do this uh, comparison and then you take the, the winner takes it all and you do the prediction. Uh, but as you see there is many things that, uh, that, 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 set, that is set into this model, into this view. What is about the hyperparameter tuning? How do you tune your hyperparameters? There is like a, the, the uh, three of Parson estimators that is using Bayesian, uh, Bayesian statistics to do this optimization, but still you set some, um, some automatic uh, distributions on the parameter. On the other hand, how do you evaluate models? So there are like uh, 20 to 40 uh, ways to compare models amongst each other. So the best model might be the worst model you can think of if you're just comparing accuracy for cases where there is a very low probability, like like uh, a very low probability of uh, uh, of, uh, of of um, predicting a probability of like fraud or something. So that if you take the uh, accuracy, the best model could be always say no, um, because that makes the the, the the small error of just uh, not getting the true ones, you know, if, if this uh, if this is true. So you, you have to think about this evaluation step as well. So there are many things you have to do. The teapot is a nice one. I, I, I like the wording. This is uh, 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 um, a very early uh, implementation of automated machine learning and it's still there and they are really great, but I, I will show you the drawbacks later on. And they, they have also their own own, own, own diagram and it's 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 the same like the last one. If you, if you take a closer look, it's the same. It's this uh, test bit is not there, but you have these raw data, data cleaning, feature processing, model uh, parameter optimization, and then you have model validation. So you have these all these steps, and um, the, mo uh, the 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 focus that Teapot sets on is uh, how to get uh, the models to get better. So like feature selection and feature construction is, is going in a circle there. And they really do some feature generation there. This is very important. This is a very important thing that an automated machine learning framework has to have. Because if you think about it, feature generation is a very important part. But if you don't know anything about it, the thing must do it for you. So um, the next step is I want to show you some frameworks. So what are the frameworks that are available there, out there? You, you, I've, I've already mentioned the teapot. There is the, um, the hyperopt is some kind of automated uh, machine learning that's also doing the tree of Parson estimator there because that's really, I think that's one of the greatest uh, 
advancements out there. There is the H2O, and I like H2O and Teapot in, in terms of, you know, uh, you're using H2O and then you generate the Teapot, whatever. And there is um, the Auto Esca Learn, which is the scikit Learn, uh, uh, which uses the scikit Learn uh, models or methods uh, to do some automated machine learning. They are growing, they, they get even growing, even more and more growing attention because they're really, really great. They're doing a great job up to now. But I haven't got I hadn't got time to to implement automated machine learning with their tool. But anyhow, I I would suggest you if you're interested also take a look at Auto uh, Scikit Learn. They are great. A show is great. I will show you. Uh, Tpod is uh, very good, but uh, in in terms of uh, the usage for for really uh, you know newcomers, it Tpod is bad because you don't see what it's doing. And the hyper opt is for uh, the more advanced. Uh, that are more interested in how to get, you know, this uh, hyperparameter optimization. Okay, uh, so how can we compare the solutions to AutoML? So I've seen more or less a very vague construction about what is happening in the auto automated machine learning. Uh, how can we compare them amongst each other? Uh, well, it's very easy. Use well-established examples and that examples are according to my opinion, uh -huh, uh, the Kaggle challenges. So there are many challenges out there that are already more or less fixed set up and you know already by, you know, by the best Kaggle users, they, they, they did this uh, uh, machine learning their best uh, codes and uh, try to predict these things. And the, the Kaggle challenges are really great because they Always, there's always the guarantee that they don't, uh, uh, how do you call it? You know, they, they, they don't cheat on, 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 on the results. And the Kaggle challenges, there is the Titanic challenge. The Titanic challenge is it's very easy. You have to predict whether a, a passenger is going to survive or he's going to, uh, to drown in, with, the, with the Titanic. So you have the the setup where you have some of the information about the passengers like two thirds and you have to do the regression and the model and then you you want to uh, say okay how good is my my uh, my prediction and you see the baseline that's the best Kegel uh, result if you're not using automated machine learning and there is like the AWS uh, the Amazon and the automated machine learning of auto scikit learn they are really doing a great job you know that, that the difference is like slight slight differences and the H2O and the teapot is doing a more or less bad job compared to the if you're doing it by hand. You, you don't know how much time it took to get this baseline or this here. You just know that, you know, H2O is just one, one step. And I will show you, this is just one call and you, you get it all. But uh, still, you see that there are m major differences between the frameworks. And if you take this, the next framework, the N is challenge. I don't know if you know this, this is the manual numeric, whatever, blah, blah. So they're, they're, they, they took the, the handwritten numbers of people uh, on, on postal letters to uh, to uh, get a, some, some kind of uh, automated reading for postal numbers in the 70s and 80s. So this was one of the first uh, uh, picture recognition tasks, but that was not deep learning. It was still in, in terms of a very classical machine learning. And to do this endless challenge, it's, it's very easy. You take the endless pictures, uh, you do uh, the learning, and then uh, you do the prediction. And H2O did a, a real great job because the difference is here like uh, from 95% to nearly 97 and a half. And that's, that's, you know, that's like uh, 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 a major step. The Teapot and the AWS is doing a bad job compared to the baseline because here you have like, uh, here you have like 92%, 95%, 97.5%. So there's, there's really that, that like worlds between the AWS and the H2. Um, so what is, what is the machine learning again in detail? So we have seen the comparisons. There are differences. Yeah, sure. But maybe it's just because they're doing the things different. So what, what's the difference? 
Uh, the Azure Automated Machine Learning has some kind of setting where you have exper uh, experiments and it takes uh, the data, it generates features, it uses the algorithm, optimizes the parameters, and generates models. And this for many different uh, uh, pipelines. So this is a pipeline, that's the, 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 the wording, I don't know how many of you already use these pipelines in R or in, in, in Python. So you have like, a, um, a uh, you, you do a scalation of your features, uh, generate new features, for instance, for time series, and then you uh, use your algorithm. This is the second step in your uh, in your pipeline, and uh, you you always uh, iterate over different parameters for the same thing. So you you're doing the same thing again and again, and you you get some training scores. But the training scores is just there to optimize the parameters. So you you're using uh, the best training scores. You, usually you do some some uh, 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 cross-validation to get good training scores. So if you're not using cross-validation in your automated ML framework, then you can forget it because this is not, you know, state of the art. But after this, you get a leaderboard, a leaderboard of all your models. And the, 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 the color indicates that there are different algorithms used there. And the leaderboard is using the test score. So you have the test set there. Uh, so i just take a look at, at the timing. Um, uh, uh, just good in time, yeah. Uh, but what else? So what 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 are the the, the three steps? Were like uh, uh, how do we do the scaling? So the the pre-processing and how what, what are the the options there? And automated machine learning has a great number of uh, sc um, uh, scalar wrappers there, and they, they they really implemented these things. So they have also many integrations in different. Um, uh, in different worlds, in different uh, flavors. So they have uh, uh, machine learning.net integration, which means they, they are in the .NET world available. They have the HD inside the Power BI, and they are also available in, on the SQL Server side. And not to forget, they are available in Python and in R, but I never used them in R. So that's, that's really a very important thing that uh, Azure ML is, is running in, in Python. Uh, what can you do with it? It can do the classification and regression forecasting in terms of time series, image classification, image multi-labeling, and image object detection. So that's all there already in one framework. But you have to decide. Don't forget, you have to decide if you want to do uh, a classification, a regression, a forecasting, and so and so on and so on. So there's still some decision taken by the user. And what is about the the, the, the algorithms? So there are really many algorithms already there. And uh, I want you to focus on, uh, on that there is the XGBoost there, which is really great to have XGBoost amongst the, 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 the possible uh, algorithms. There is the GBM algorithm, there's a decision tree, the nearest neighbor estimator, support vector machines, uh, random forests. There are these uh, um, deep networks, deep neural network classifiers, um, and so on and so on. So there are, there are many different, and also for the time series, they are, they are uh, considering the profit of, of, of Facebook, so this profit uh, algorithm there. So there are really many algorithms there, um, and it's considering all of them, and it's trying out all of them. So this is a really great framework in terms of alternatives that are used. But how do you use it? So Let's start, and I will show you Teapot at first, and you will immediately see what is the difference amongst the algorithms if you're looking at, the, uh, at how the algorithms run. First of all, I had to do uh, all these codes yesterday because it takes like an hour to calculate all these models. Um, even if you're just doing like an, a, small, uh, a small number of models. But how do you do this? So you first of all load uh, the data. This is the MNIST challenge uh, that you've seen already for the teapot. So you load the, the, these pictures, the small little pictures, and you do the split. You have this tra tra train split there. Uh, why don't I do this validation split? The test is the validation, and that's a bit awkward compared to the, the, the diagrams. The test is set aside to do the validation in the end. 
And the second test train split is done by the algorithm itself. So you have to take care that this is using uh, uh, cross-validation or any other kind of valid measurement to optimize the parameters. This is very important. So this T-plot classifier and the T-plot fitting is doing that for you, but you have to take care that this is done. So I'll split Mario, it up. Yeah. Can you zoom in a little bit or turn temporarily yeah. your webcam off? Because I, then I think it will be even more. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. So this one. OK, thank you. Uh, so this is uh, this is a very important uh, thing there. So you, you, you have to take care that this is uh, this classification or this uh, uh, framework has this uh, very important aspect in, inside because otherwise you have to do this. Um, um, then you do the, the fitting and then again I do the scoring just just to get some some uh, some nice uh, things there and I, I, I uh, as a as a nice feature of the teapot uh, you can export a Python script that's just uh, uh, I have to take a look into the to the short. There is my teapot. There it is. So when you take a look at this one here, this is the script that that is generated, and you see uh, it's it's sometimes it's okay, but uh, this is you know uh, a perfect. Uh, example how to do the prediction with the teapot uh, with the teapot code. So you get a, a ready-made scoring file, so to say. So this is very nice if you uh, if you want to use uh, the teapot. The bad thing is you don't know what happened. You don't know what uh, what exact uh, uh, pipelines and everything are used. You can uh, turn on the the verbosity, but it's still you don't know exactly what happened in the background, so you don't know how many models were calculated and which uh, uh, algorithms were taken, and it takes some time to get into that. It's it's really there. There, uh, the, the the output is not very useful of the teapot. You can go into that, but that's also work, and that is a major difference to other uh, to other frameworks, especially to the two ones that I'm going to present you right in a minute. Um, the, the point here is the target column you set, you take, set the time column, uh, and so on and so on, and then you read the data. And I did an example if all of, uh, all three of those frameworks with the uh, prediction of the power consumption of New York. You get precipitation, temperature, and the time. So in, in hours, so hour by hour, with, I think there are two years of time in there, and then you, you train a model. So you uh, you get like this data set, and I made up the, these uh, ficti fictitious uh, features there because these features are not generated automatically by the teapot. The teapot has no feature generation for uh, for this uh, time series. I didn't find it at least um, because I don't like it. <laughs> but uh, I just want to show you how this how these things work. So. Um, you take uh, you take uh, the teapot classifier, a teapot regressor. One moment. Uh, so I just did some 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 calculations there to show you that there is like uh, binary features and these are categorical features, so that everything works fine. And uh, I, I take the teapot regressor in this case because you have to take the choice whether it is a classification or a regression you want to do, and then you start with uh, uh, what you want to do. You have this random state. This is also very important to know how um, how these things works. Uh, you, you have to have the random state. This is a statistical point of view that your regressions are reproducible with the same uh, with the same data. So you don't want to have some random good examples uh, because the, 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 uh, the random values were uh, positive for your regressions and you cannot reproduce the results. Um, okay, uh, but that, it would take too long to, to explain it in detail. Uh, it is very important that teapot regressor uses generation, so it reproduces uh, the same algorithms again and again. Uh, and how many uh, population, uh, population size, how many uh, do you want to uh, generate? And 
the verbosity is again to to know what happens. But it's still for me, I don't like the the, the output of the tipot regressor. Anyhow, uh, after that, you you do the, the the fitting. This is the fitting, and it's everything you have to do. After that, you can start with the scoring, and scoring means prediction. So you use the teapot regressor and you predict these remaining two days. I, 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 I set aside two days of this energy data, and this is the prediction. So this is the true value, and the perfect uh, prediction would be if you're really near this true value. Rem remember this diagram. This diagram is telling you we are always overestimating the, the uh, demand, the energy demand for New York with this data. But I will come back to that later. Let's switch over to H2O. H2O is, is another framework. This is very nice because you get like a, an own home, uh, uh, an own uh, uh, web front end for the back end that is working on your PC. This front end uh, remembers everything you did. So it, it has got these uh, models in there and all, all kinds of things. But it forgets it. Don't forget this. It forgets everything as soon as you turn down your computer. So there is a way to remember these things. So you have to have H2O running uh, uh, not uh, as a local instance, but as a full instance. Then you, you have a, a, a storage, a continuous storage for your models. But the standard installation for Python is it forgets everything. So be, be aware of that at least. So H2O is starting up. Uh, you, you're starting up H2O by saying H2O in it, and you're setting it up to use some 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 random amount of memory of yours. It's very important to have this set up, and you see what is the remaining memory for the cluster, and this is 14 gigabytes. So you have to have enough room on your uh, PC. Why is that so? Because H2O is not running on your Python. Uh, it is using your PC in the background. There is a Java implementation of many different algorithms, but that's not a Python implementation. It's not running in your Python uh, session. H2O is running set aside on a different thing. And there is also an implementation of the H2O on Spark, which is sparkling water. It's a funny name because H2O is water. Yeah, yeah sure. But um, the, the point there is, you're using Spark to do the distribution of uh, calculating many different algorithms, and that's even more efficient. There is also an automated machine learning in, in the Spark context using Scala, but that goes far too far away from, from what I wanted to cover. So first of all, you have to say H2O, what is the data frame? As you're not calculating in your context, in your Python setting, you have to load the data into the H2O context, so to say, into this web front end. Then, after that, you start by uh, uh, by saying, what do you want to do with it? You want to do a classifier uh, with automated machine learning, uh, uh, not a classifier, uh, automated machine learning regression, and you want to do 35 models, and also, again, this random number. This is very important to have this setup. Uh, without it, your results won't be reproducible. It's very, very important. I really want to strain this. Um, and then you say, OK, I want to train it, and I want to start with it, and, and so on. So this is uh, very nice. You're, saying, you're specifying here, you're specifying the columns, because you're saying, I want to use the uh, the data frame that's already loaded into the H2. After this, this took like 49 minutes. So uh, you see this, this automated machine learning is not for free. You really, it take, you really take some time to do this machine learning. And you see this is the leaderboard. Uh, uh, you see that uh, this is what happened uh, on, the, on the machine learning side. So this, this did some uh, uh, generated boosted uh, trees and a stacked ensemble. This is a feature of the very good frameworks. So H2O, automated machine learning in, in, in Azure, and also the automated machine learning in Databricks, if you're using Scala, they all have these uh, available to use also ensemble methods. They are, again, you can talk about ensemble methods in our person. But still, if you're looking into that, this is a feature of good uh, uh, automated machine learning uh, frameworks. Um, so these are the, the, the uh, 
classifiers uh, or the, the regressors here. And I want to get the leader. So what is the best one? The best one is this method. Then I take out this one uh, uh, and say, uh, what are the parameters? What were the parameters of this one? And you can see that there are cross validation parameters, uh, the, the tree intervals. So they're, they're really like everything was optimized. The number of trees here, you see this, uh, this is a, 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 a general boosted method. The, 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 the number of trees is very important. So you have these 348 trees there, uh, which are more tree stumps. So they're, they're, they are not trees in the general boosted method. Um, so you try to to read this uh, model to do the uh, to do the prediction, but also you can, as I mentioned, they are not stored in the standard installation. You lose all your trained models. So if you want to keep them, you have to save them locally, and you use this uh, method there to store the the model. You use the predict method to do the prediction. Again, the prediction happens in H two O, so you have to have a cluster running to do the prediction there, uh, and then you see. The predictions. So these are the, the values, and here you have the predictions of the energy demand. Again, I did this very nice picture there, and you see there's again an overestimation, which seems to be, you know, maybe the, the New Yorkers uh, start saving uh, energy or something, but this, the, the models always overestimate the consumption in August. Uh, I tried to do the same, same thing with the second best algorithm, but still, you know, you see that there is some overestimation there. Uh, I will come to that later. Um, so this is H2O. H2O, you can see uh, if, if, you, if you go in there, you can easily uh, get the information. You get every kind of model. Um, the winner was the GPM. Uh, this was the second test. Let's try this one. Uh, you see that there are many cross validations running as well. They have this underscore CV. So every cross validated model is also displayed there. But you can take a look here. You have this uh, number of trees there. You, you, you can easily get very, very nice insight. It's very important to have the temperature, the hour, the month, and so on and so on and you have many more insights there. Uh, the important thing is you know what happens. You know exactly what happens and what is the best model, and you can go there and reproduce this result with the general normal GBM method of Python. You can reproduce this. This is very nice, and this is very important. This is a very good feature of an automated framework. And let's get to the third one. The third one is the automated machine learning of Azure. In Azure, you have to have your automated machine learning workspace. Okay, that's bad. Again, here, session expired. Okay. Uh, one moment. Uh, yeah. So, very good. Okay. This is a, a machine learning workspace. You have to have this to use the automated machine learning. Yeah, sure, you, you get a very nice service. You have to pay for that. This is one very important difference to all the other uh, frameworks. The framework of the Azure machine learning is you have to pay for it, but it's it's got many more features than this. Because if you take a look at the H2O, the H2O is you know, just half of the way uh, of the Azure machine learning. The Azure machine learning has experiments, pipelines, ca uh, computes, uh, models, and so on. So you, you can decide where to calculate your machine learning algorithms. You can say, I want to do it locally or I want to do it in the cloud. You can uh, process everything in the cloud. And that's very easy because you don't have to take care um, uh, to, 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 to have your laptop running all the time. You don't have to take care of, of any other issues with uh, resources and so on and so on. Um, so this is one nice thing, but also a bad thing because you have to pay for it. So this, there, you get something out of it, but also you have to pay for it. But the other thing is Azure keeps everything you do in memory in the cloud. So you know what you did last summer, so to say. Uh, that's also a very important thing. 
Because with H2O, you lose, if you don't do it correctly, the installation, you lose many information. Um, that's especially if you're starting up from, from, from scratch, then you lose many information if you don't do it right. With automated machine learning, you cannot do it wrong. That's a very important uh, thing here with Azure Machine Learning. So you log into machine learning, you have a workspace, you load it from a config file, you get the config file, by downloading it here. So this is, you know, you click on here, you get the config file. The config file specifies the, uh, the subscription ID and all other things that are necessary. And after that, you can access it just by saying, load my workspace and perfect, fine. After that, uh, you start up by generating an experiment by hand, by clicking here, you say, I want to do a new experiment. So you go here and say, uh, uh, add a new experiment somewhere. Ah, that's there. It's over there. Um, you can add a new experiment here, but you can do it in the code here. So that's, that's the thing. Uh, what is an experiment? An experiment should be, you know, if you're going to predict the energy demand for New York, you always do it in the same experiment to be able to compare the different models you did over time. Um, then after all, uh, you start to generate the commu uh, a compute. The compute is uh, more or less important if you don't want to run it on your PC. Uh, that's the only thing when you need a compute. Uh, uh, without this, you don't need any compute, uh, at least for the training of models. Um, then you load the data. Again, it's the same as with H2O. You want to have the data also in the cloud. So you have here, you have your data set and you have the uploaded energy demand as a data set in the cloud. You can do that with, uh, with Azure ML, but you don't have to do it at least. It's not so good in my, in, in my, uh, in my view, but, uh, I would, I would suggest you to do this. Uh, um, then you have to set up some parameters. So you have to set up the test and the train split. And after that, you have uh, the max horizon. The max horizon is telling in terms of a data, a, a time series, because the Azure ML framework is one of the few uh, frameworks that is uh, aware of time series. So it's able to train time series. Uh, you set up the, the time series uh, as, as a forecasting set for the autom automated machine learning. And then you have like 10,000 different parameters. And uh, you say you want to run it. Uh, if you, if you do the submit with using, uh, you have the compute set up here, a compute target in the cloud, you run it in the cloud and the, 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 the code is submitted to your compute target and it's calculated on a compute target and you go for lunch or whatever. You can turn down your computer, whatever you want to do, but this is done in the cloud. If you don't want to do it that way, you can change and uh, 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 do, uh, do the calculation on your computer to save some money because you don't need the computer. So the remote run finished and you want to get the output. If, if you want to wait the remote run to finish, that's very easily done by wait for compute completion. So this is very stringent in, 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 in the whole Azure framework. You can wait for anything to finish. Uh, you get the best run and the fitted model if you get the, the output of a run uh, and you want to have the steps. As I said, this is a pipeline. It uses a time series transformer. After that, uh, it uses a standard, standard scalar wrapper because first of all, you want to generate like week, month, day and so on. And after that, you do the standard scalar wrapper uh, on the precipitation and the, 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 the temperature. And after that, you do a random forest regressor. That's the winner. So th th there may be a, a, also a, a min-max scalar wrapper and a SVM, for instance, uh, in the thing in the in, in the cloud. So what what are the the, the in the model? What are the fitted uh, variables? You see that this is also doing some imputation. If you know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, uh, 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 you can read that up easily. Uh, when there is missing data, usually you have to throw away the, the, the observations. Here, it's, it's using imputation. It did some uh, nice uh, time series transformation. So the whole date is split up into year, half year, quarter, month, day, hour, 
a.m. p.m. hour 12 uh, weekday. Uh, uh, this is, I think, this is the month day or the quarter day, and then it's the week. Um, and this featureization is happening automatically for you. Uh, if you take it, uh, if you take the time, there is there is there is also the information about how this is done, so you can go into the details of everything that happens with every model, not only the winner model. Um, and then I just wanted to show you that you don't need to put in the the real y values because to do a prediction with uh, passing the real y values would be very awkward. So I did uh, generate a, a, a NAN uh, vector. Uh, with the y values and did the prediction so to be sure that there is nothing going on awkwardly and um, did some metrics again and after that I did the, the drawing and this is my final presentation of this result no it's not actually I've got some funny thing going on now but compare it with this one and this one so these are the the, the winners of all of all algorithms but you see that the Azure ML is doing a good job as a framework. The Azure ML is aware of having a time series, is aware of what to do with it, but you have to pay for it. So you get something out of that, uh, that it's, it's really more capable if you don't know what you do. If you know what you do, you would have done the transformation, the time series transformation in the correct way. But what, what, what are the points? I, I just want to go back to my presentation and show you a few points. So it's not so easy. Uh, you, you have to know what has been done with Teapot. You don't know it exactly. What are Aria, the problems? You can add your webcam again if you want. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So now I'm there. I'm back again. Hi. Um, yes. Uh, what has been done is not, you're not aware of what has been done in ev every framework. But you're aware in the good ones. So in the H2O and in the in the in the Azure framework, you know what exactly has been done. Um, why do we still need parameters? Is a good question because the parameters optimize uh, things there, and you have to know the optimization thing there. It's not the parameters of the algorithms; it's, it's the parameters to choose which algorithms to optimize. So it, it's still it's parameters on parameters that you optimize. So it's still there's still some decision taken of the person that's using it. And also I want to show you, there are some comparisons of uh, algorithms in the, in the cloud, uh, which is very nice. I, think, I find it uh, uh, awkwardly strange to see that there is a, a, a difference between getting a regression and a classification uh, between the algorithms. I thought that either you're good or not, but that's not the case. So you have really differences where like uh, the, the AutoML is very bad for the classification. This is not the Azure AutoML, it's a different one, but it's an, again, a f another framework. But you see that there are really differences. So the best uh, uh, classification framework is not the best uh, regression framework. So there's also, again, so you have a framework, but that's not the best framework. I, I wanted to show you something about the, the, the automated machine learning in the cloud with the click through thing. Uh, I don't have time for that, but you can go through it. Uh, it's very important to have the knowledge who decides. Who decides on methods, on parameters, on variables, on metrics, on pipelines, and all these things. That's automatically done. And it's very important for you to know that this is done by the computer sometimes, and it chooses an optimal way, what it seems to be optimal for the computer. So it's optimal for the computer to do the, the, the world war of human against robotics uh, with uh, you know, pre-modern weaponry, because the most, uh, the most wars were won with, uh, with this pre-modern uh, pre weaponry. So uh, like uh, spares and, uh, uh, and arrows. Uh, you know, this is, Sometimes awkward, the decisions are awkward and you have to be aware of that this is done by rare statistics, by, 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 by really bare statistics. And the metrics, so I, I already told you that there are metrics you have to decide on what is the winner. The winner takes it all, but the winner is not the winner because there are so many metrics you have to choose amongst. And this also changes the result. So you have to be aware of what you do by choosing a metric. I don't have time to go into that, but these metrics are really, 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 really 
important. And also the algorithm, the different frameworks uh, support different algorithms. H2O and AutoML, Azure AutoML support XGBoost. This is one of the new fancy uh, classical solutions and it's very good. And they are always amongst the winners um, or the candidates. So you have to be aware that the, the good algorithms are in the frameworks already. So this is also an important thing there. Uh, if you take a look here, you have the XGBoost in the, uh, this is Azure ML and this is the XGBoost in the H2O. And who takes responsibility for the decisions taken automatically or not? So uh, if you think about automatic driving, it's like automatic machine learning. Uh, yeah, who is who is responsible? The one who's driving or the one who's, uh, uh, who's sitting in the back uh, and gets driven to somewhere. So it's a very important thing there. So what are the conclusions? Uh, I've, I've done a narrow, I, I wanted to add this one. It's a faster application. So automatic machine learning is a faster application of a numerous increasing number of different algorithms. And it's very important. The code is error free to some extent, I, I have to say. But it's definitely more error free <laughs> if you want to <laughs> take it that way, more error free than the code that you would produce. Because sometimes you, you see, ah, there's a new algorithm. You take a copy paste example from like Stack Overflow for XGBoost and then you do it and ah, missed, uh, it's not working. And you don't know why you do some changes and then you, you immediately incorporate an error there. And that, that the examples and that, that the really that the frameworks they are using tested code and there is like, you know, tested code is always better than the, the just example code. Uh, this is a very important advantage. But you have to have prepared data and that's nothing that can be done automatically so far. So the data understanding must be on your side. The quality of data must be on your side. So you have to think about the quality of the data. If you know the correct target function, it's nearly perfect. If you know the target function, which is uh, according to the, the metric that you choose, then you have a perfect way of doing things. And I, I use automated machine learning already, but only if I'm aware what I'm doing. Because be aware, what is the real task of automated machine learning? Take a look again. It's not about data, it's about the method. Uh, the smarter the user, the smarter the output. It's nothing about the code, it's the user, because you're changing the, the, the things, how it works. Define clean and prepared data, it's 70 to 90% of work and it's still not done automatically. If you, you know, if you give it garbage, it won't be, you know, the nicest thing you get out of it. Define the tasks, including what to do with it and what not to do with it for the framework, because you, you, you're, you're guiding the framework by, by your parameters. It's nothing that you can change. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's nothing that you cannot change, yeah? It, you, you're, you're really, if you're using the default parameters, you're using the default nonsense. Okay, steps to success. Prevent overfitting by choosing the wrong metrics and using a test set. Time series or not time series, the framework is, is understanding your time series or not. And then if you have time series, you have to choose the frameworks that understand time series, is time series aware. Use balanced data, or at least be aware of imbalanced data. That's very important. As I, as I already said, uh, with the accuracy, accuracy is very bad with imbalanced data. Uh, more data and more compute time is not always the best solution. Sometimes the, 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 the computational side of data science always says, oh, well, let's train a bit harder, then we get better uh, results. It's bad. As a statistician, I have to say that's the worst idea you can ever get. Uh, and prefer the simple model over complex ones. So if you get a neural net as the first one, and then again, there is no neural net in like the, 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 the next places, and you get only random forest as a, as a second, third, and fourth place, you should not use the neural net. That was just by coincidence, a better, a better be aware of statistics. It's just coincidence. It's not, it's not a, uh, uh, um, uh, a real result. And be aware, uh, the computer always needs the smarter human to get the smarter results. Um, 
What, we, what have we not been talking about? We have not been talking about how to get the prediction. And this is also something I want to focus for Azure ML supports you to get good predictions. Again, H2O is very aware of, but not leading you so far with Azure ML, you also can provide the prediction REST APIs for your models and also Docker containers and everything. I wanted to show you if you're interested in like two minutes, something that uh, that is also very interesting. First of all, thanks to the Platin and Gold sponsors. It's very important to have these sponsors. And again, there is a, a masterclass, the European Cloud Conference. Uh, and just in short, what I uh, what I wanted to tell you is you've seen this example. This example is a very good example from Microsoft for how not to do it. Because if you take a look at the predictions. The predictions use the real temperature and the real uh, precipitation on these days. Do you know the real temperature and the real precipitation on the next two, three, four days? No, you just know predi uh, so, so predictive models. So uh, you just know the weather forecast. It's, it's not the real value. So you should have used the forecasted values in, in, in advance in your training data because otherwise you do a training training to uh, uh, prediction failure, you incorporate that uh, prediction error of your uh, weather prediction. Otherwise, you get something like this. I just cleared the, uh, the, the real temperature in the model, in, in the test data, and set it to a, a mean temperature for the whole next two days. And the model immediately gets really bad because it cuts off the heating <laughs> in, the, in the cold, area and it cut off the cooling in the warm area. And that's that's really immediately seen by this by this uh, picture. So the frameworks do not uh, cancel the work that you do by thinking and knowing thinking about and knowing your data. Please be aware of that. Okay. Which questions do we have? So thank you again and I will focus on some questions. Yep. Maria, can I ask you a favor, please? Uh, it's yep. already immediately before the next round of session starts. I have copied one question that has uh, been has remained open and mm -hmm. I've copied it to Discord. Maybe you can answer it there so that yep. people can switch to other yep. sessions uh, if they are interested. OK, yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for listening. And I hope it was not too much. I tried to cover really a whole lot of things, but I know I covered not everything. <laughs> Thank you and goodbye then.